design highly reliable the digital electronics and it will be delivered to you by Shimon and Stefan. Warm applause for them. All right, good morning Congress. Um, so perhaps every one of you in the room here has at one point or another in their lives uh, witnessed their computer behaving weirdly and doing things that it uh, was not supposed to do uh, or what you didn't anticipate it to do. And while typically that would have probably been the result of a, a software bug of some sort somewhere inside the uh, huge software stack your PC is running on, uh, have you ever considered what the probability of this weird behavior being caused by a bit flip somewhere in your uh, memory of your computer might have been? So what you can see in this video on the, on the screen now um, is a, a physics experiment called a cloud chamber. It's a very simple experiment that it's actually able to uh, visualize and, and make apparent uh, all the constant uh, stream of background radiation we all are uh, constantly uh, exposed to. So what's happening here is that uh, highly energetic particles, for example, from space, um, they trace through um, the gaseous alcohol and they collide with alcohol molecules and they form in this process a trail of condensation uh, while they do that. And if you think about your computer, um, a typical cell of RAM, um, of which you might have, I don't know, 4, 8, 10 gigabytes in your machine, uh, is as big as only 80 nanometers wide, so it's very, very tiny. And you probably are able to appreciate the small amount of energy that is needed or that is used to store the information inside each of those bits um, and the sheer amount of, of those bits you have in your RAM in your computer. So a couple of years ago, there was a study that concluded that in a computer with about four gigabytes of RAM, uh, a bit flip um, caused by such an event by uh, cosmic background radiation can occur about once every 33 hours, so a bit less than, than one per day. Um, in an incident in 2008, a Qantas Airlines flight uh, actually nearly crashed, um, and the reason for this crash uh, was traced back uh, to be very likely caused by an, a bit flip somewhere in one of the CPUs of the avionics system and nearly uh, caused the death of a lot of, pa uh, of passengers on this plane. In 2003, uh, in Belgium, uh, a small municipal vote um, uh, actually had a, a weird hiccup in which one of the candidates in this vote, in this election, actually got 4,096 more votes um, added in a single instance, and that was traced back to be very likely caused by cosmic background radiation flipping a memory cell somewhere that stored the vote count. And it was only discovered that this happened because this number of votes for this particular candidate was considered unreasonable, but otherwise would have gotten away probably without being detected. So um, a few words about us. Um, so uh, Shimon and I, we both work at CERN in the microelectronics section, and we both uh, develop electronics that need to be tolerant to these sorts of effects. So we develop radiation-tolerant electronics for the experiments uh, at CERN, at the LHC, uh, among a lot of other applications. Uh, you can meet the two of us at the Ludla Jena assembly if you are interested um, in what we are talking about today. And uh, we will also give a small um, the talk about, or a small workshop, uh, about radiation detection tomorrow in one of the seminar rooms. So feel free to pass by there. It will be a quick introduction. Um, to give you a small idea of what, we, what kind of environment we are working for, so if you would uh, use one of those, your default Intel i7 CPUs from your notebook and would put it anywhere we, we uh, operate our uh, electronics, it would very shortly die in a matter of uh, probably one or two minutes. And it would die for more than uh, just one reason, which is rather interesting and compelling. So the idea for today's talk is to give you all an insight into uh, all the things uh, that need to be taken into account when you design electronics for radiation environments, um, what kind of different challenges come when you try to do that. Uh, we classify and explain the different types of radiation effects that exist, and then we also present what you can do to mitigate these effects and also validate that what you did to uh, care for them or protect your circuits actually worked. Um, and of course, as we do that, uh, we'll try to give our view on, on how we develop radiation tolerant electronics at CERN and what we, how our workflow looks like to make sure uh, this works. So well, let's first maybe take a look, a step back and have a look at what we mean when we say radiation environments. Uh, the first one that you probably uh, have in mind right now when you think about radiation uh, is space. So 
Um, this uh, interstellar space is basically filled with uh, very high speed, highly energetic uh, electrons and protons and all sorts of uh, high energy uh, particles. Um, and while they, for example, uh, traverse close to planets as our Earth, uh, these planets have sometimes do have a magnetic field. Um, and the uh, highly energetic particles are actually uh, deflected by these magnetic fields and they um, can protect the planets as, as our planet, for example, from this highly energetic radiation. But in the pro uh, process there around these planets, sometimes they form these radiation belts uh, known as the Van Allen belts after the guy who discovered this effect a long time ago. Um, and a satellite in space, as it uh, orbits around the Earth, might, depending on what orbit is chosen, uh, sometimes go through these belts of highly intense radiation um, that, of course, then needs to be taken into account uh, when designing electronics for such a satellite. Um, and it, if Earth itself is not able to give you enough radiation, you may think of the very famous uh, Juno uh, Jupiter mission, mission uh, that uh, became famous about a year ago. Um, they actually, uh, in the environment of Jupiter, they, uh, exper or they anticipated so much radiation that they actually decided to put all the electronics of the satellite inside a one centimeter thick cube of titanium, um, which is uh, famously known as the uh, Juno radiation vault. But not only space offers a radiation environments, another form of radiation you probably all recognize is when I show you this picture, which is an, an X-ray image of a hand. Um, and the uh, X-ray is also considered a form of radiation. And while, of course, uh, the doses or amounts of radiation any patient is exposed to uh, while doing diagnosis or treatment of some disease, um, that might not be the full story when it comes to medical applications. So this is a, a medical particle accelerator, um, which is used for cancer treatment. And in these sorts of accelerators, typically carbon ions or um, protons are accelerated and then focused and used to treat uh, and selectively destroy cancer cells in the body. And this can, comes already relatively close to the environment we are working in and working for. Um, so Shimon and I are working, for example, for, uh, on electronics for the CMS detector inside the LHC, um, in which we, for which we build dedicated um, radiation-tolerant um, integrated circuits. Uh, which have to withstand uh, very, very large amounts and doses of short-lived radiation um, in order to function correctly. And if we didn't uh, specifically design electronics for that, uh, basically the whole system would never uh, be able to work. To illustrate a bit how this environment, um, how you can imagine the, the scale of this environment, uh, this is a single plot of a uh, collision event that was recorded in the ATLAS experiment. And each of those tiny little traces uh, you can make out in this diagram is actually either one or multiple secondary particles uh, that were created in the initial collision of uh, two proton bunches inside uh, the experiment. Um, and, and each of those, of course, it uh, races around uh, the detector electronics, which make these traces visible, um, itself then decaying into multiple other secondary particles, uh, which all go, th go through our electronics. And if that doesn't sound let's say, bad enough for digital electronics. Um, these collisions happens about, uh, happen about 40 million times a second, of course, multiplying the number of events uh, or yeah, problems they can cause in our circuits. So let's do a, so we, we now want to introduce um, all the things that, that can happen, the different radiation effects. But first, probably, we go back to uh, let's take a step back and look at what we mean when we say digital electronics or digital logic, uh, which we want to focus on today. So from your university lectures or um, your reading, you probably know the first class of digital logic, which is the combinatorial logic. So this is typically logic that just does a simple linear relation of the inputs of a circuit and produces an output, um, as exemplified with these AND and OR or NAND XOR gates that you see here. Um, but if you want to build, I mean, even though we use those uh, everywhere in our circuits, you probably also want to store state in a more complex circuit. Um, for example, in the, the registers of your CPU, they store some sort of internal uh, information. And for that, we use the other class of logic, which is called the sequential logic. So this is typically clocked with some system clock frequency, uh, and it changes its output with relation to the inputs whenever this clock signal changes. And now if we look at how these, all these different logic functionalities are implemented, so typically nowadays for that, you may know that we use CMOS technologies and basically represent all this logic functionality as uh, digital uh, gates using small PMOS and NMOS uh, MOSFET transistors in CMOS technologies. Um, 
And uh, if we kind of try to build a model for, for digital or more complex digital circuits, uh, we typically use something we call the finite state machine model, um, in which uh, we, we use a model that consists of a combinatorial and a sequential part. And uh, the, you can see that the output of this circuit depends both on the internal state inside the register as well as also the input to the combinatorial logic. And uh, accordingly, also the state that is internally is always changed by the inputs as well as the current state. So this is kind of the simple model for more complex systems that can be used to, to model different effects. Um, now let's try to actually look at what the radiation can do to transistors. And for that, we are going to have a quick recap at what a transistor actually is and how it looks like. Uh, as you may perhaps uh, know is that in CMOS technologies, transistors are built on wafers of high purity silicon. So this is a crystalline, very uh, regularly organized lattice of silicon atoms. And what we do to form a transistor on such a wafer is that we uh, add dopants. Um, so uh, in order to form diffusion regions, which later will become the source and drain of our transistors. And then on top of that, we grow a layer of, of insulating oxide. And on top of that, we put polysilicon, which forms the gate terminal of the transistor. And in the end, we end up with an equivalent circuit a bit like that. And uh, now to put things back into perspective, you may also know that the dimension of these structures are very tiny. So we talk about tens of nanometers um, for some of the dimensions I've outlined here. And as the, the technologies shrink, these, uh, uh, these become smaller and smaller. And therefore, you probably also realize or are able to appreciate the small amounts of energy that are used to store information inside these digital circuits, uh, which makes them perhaps more sensitive to radiation. So let's uh, take a look what different types of radiation effects exist. And uh, we typically, in this case, um, differentiate them into two main classes of events. The first one would be the cumulative effects, which are effects that, as the name implies, accumulate over time. So as the a circuit is placed inside some radiation environment, over time it accumulates more and more dose and therefore um, worsens its performance or changes how it operates. And on the other side, we have the single event effects, which are uh, always events that happen at some instantaneous point in time and then suddenly, um, without being predictable, change how the circuit operates or how it functions or if it works in the first place or not. Uh, so I'm going to first go into the class of cumulative effects, and then later on, Shimon will uh, go into the other class of the single event effects. So in terms of these uh, accumulating effects, we basically have two main subclasses. Uh, the first one being ionization, or TID effects, for total ionizing dose, and the second one being displacement damages. Um, so displacement damages do exactly what they sound like. It is uh, all the effects that happen when an atom in the silicon lattice is actually displaced, so removed from its lattice position, and actually changes the, the structure of the semiconductor. Um, but luckily, these effects don't have a big impact in the CMOS uh, digital circuits that we are looking at today, so we will disregard them for the moment. And we'll be looking more at the ionization damage, or TID. So ionization, as a quick recap, is um, whenever... Uh, um, uh, Electrons are removed uh, or added to an atom, um, effectively transforming it uh, into an ion. Um, and these effects are, um, ha uh, are especially critical for the circuits we are building, because what they do is that they change the behavior of the transistors. And without looking too much into the, the semiconductor details, um, I just want to show their effect, their typical effect that we are concerned about it in this very simple uh, circuit here. So this is just an, an inverter circuit consisting of two transistors uh, here and there. And uh, what the circuit does in normal operation is does it just takes an input signal and inverts and basically gives the inverted signal at the output. Um, and as this, uh, the transistors are irradiated and accumulate dose, you can see that uh, the edges of the output signal, they get slower. So uh, the transistor takes longer to turn on and off. And what that does in turn is that it limits the maximum operation frequency of your circuit. Um, and of course, that is not something you want to do. You want your circuit to operate at some frequency in your final system. And if the maximum frequency it can work at degrades over time, at some point it will fail as the maximum frequency is just too low. So let's have a look at what we can do to mitigate these effects. Uh, the first one, and I already mentioned it when talking about the Juno mission, uh, is shielding. So you can, if you can actually put a box around your electronics and shield any radiation from actually hitting your transistors, it is obvious that they will uh, last longer and it will suffer less from the radiation damage that it would otherwise do. Uh, so this approach is very often used in, in space applications, like on satellites, but it's not very useful if you're actually trying to measure the radiation with your circuits, as we do 
for example, in the particle accelerators we build integrated circuits for. So there, uh, first of all, we want to measure the radiation, so we cannot shield our detectors from the radiation. And also, we don't want to influence the tracks of these secondary collision products with any shielding material that would be in the way. So this is not very useful in a particle accelerator um, environment, let's say. So we have to resort to different methods. So as I said, we do have to uh, design our own integrated circuits in the first place. So we have some freedom uh, in what we call transistor level design. So we can um, have actually, we can actually alter the dimensions of the transistors. We can make them larger to um, withstand larger doses of radiation. And we can use special techniques uh, in terms of layout um, that we can experimentally verify to be more resistant to radiation effects. Um, and as a third measure, which is probably the most important one for us, uh, is what we call modeling. So we actually are able to characterize all the effects um, that radiation will have on a transistor. And if we can do that, if we will know if I put it into a radiation environment for a year, how much, will it how much slower will it become, then it is, of course, easy to say, OK, I can just over-design my circuit and make it a bit more simple, maybe have less functionality, but able to operate at a higher frequency and therefore withstand uh, the, the radiation effects for a longer uh, time while still working sufficiently well at the end of its expected lifetime. Um, so that's more or less what we can do about these effects, and I'll hand over to Shimon for the second class. Contrary to cumulative effects presented by Stefan, the other group are single event effects, which are caused by high energy deposits, which are caused by a single particle or shower of particles and they can happen at any time, even seconds after, your, uh, after irradiation is started. It means that if your circuit is vulnerable to this type class of effects, it can fail immediately after, after radiation is present. And here we also classify these effects into several groups. The first are hard or permanent errors, which as the name indicates, they, they can permanently destroy uh, your circuit. And those, this type of errors are typically critical for power devices where you have large power densities and they are not so much of a problem for digital circuits. The other class of effects are soft errors. Uh, and here we distinguish transient or single event transient errors, which are spurious signals propagating in your circuit as a, f uh, as a result of a uh, gate being hit by a particle and they are especially problematic for analog circuits or asynchronous digital circuits, but under some circumstances they can be also problematic for uh, synchronous systems. And the other class of uh, problems are static or single event upset problems, which basically means that uh, your memory element, like a register, gets flipped. And then, of course, if your system is not designed to handle this type of errors properly, it can lead to a failure. So in the, in the following part of the presentation, we will focus mostly on soft errors. So let's try to, to understand what is the origin of this type of problem. So as Stefan uh, mentioned, typical transistor is built out of uh, diffusions, gate, and uh, channel. So here you can see one uh, diffusion. Let's assume that it is a drain diffusion. And then when a particle goes through and deposits uh, ch uh, charge, it creates free electron and hole pairs, which then in the presence of electric field, they get uh, collected by means of drift, which results in a large current spike, which is very short. And then the rest of the charge could be collected by diffusion, which is much slower process, and therefore also the amplitude of the event is much, uh, much smaller. So let's try to, to, to understand what could happen in a typical memory cell. So on this schematic, you can see the simplest memory cell, which is composed of two back-to-back -back inverters. And let's assume that uh, node A is at high and node B is at low potential initially. And then we have a particle hitting drain of transistor M1, which creates a short circuit current between drain and ground, bringing the, the drain of transistor M1 to, to low potential, which also uh, acts on the gate of second inverter, temporarily changing its state from low to high, which reinforces the wrong state in the first inverter. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the animation. Yeah, so, and the, at this uh, time, the, 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 the error is locked in your memory cell and you basically lost your information. So you may be asking yourself how much charge is needed really to flip a state of a memory cell. And you can get this number from either simulations or from measurements. So let's assume that uh, what we could do, we could try to inject some current to, to the sensitive node, for example, drain of transistor M1. 
And here what I will show is that on the top plot you will have current as a function of time, on the second plot you will have vol output voltage, so voltage at node B as a function of time, and at the lowest plot you will see a probability of having a bit flip. So if you inject very little current, of course nothing changes at the output, but once you start increasing the, the amount of cu uh, current you're injecting, you see that something appears at the output, and at some point the output will uh, toggle, so it, would, it will switch to the other state. And uh, at this point, if you really calculate how, what is the area under, of, uh, under uh, the, cur the current curve, you can find what is the, the, the critical charge needed to flip the, the memory cell. And if you, if you go further, if you start injecting even more current, you will not see that much difference in the, in the uh, output voltage. Uh, waveform, it could become only slightly faster. And at this point you also can notice that the, the probability now jump to one, which means that any time you inject so much current that, that there is a fault in your circuit. And of course, uh, so, so, so for, for now we, we just found what is the probability of having a bit flip from zero to one in node B. Of course, we should also calculate the same for the, uh, the, the other direction, so from 1 to 0, and usually it is slightly different. And then, of course, we should inject in all the other uh, nodes, for example, node B, and we also should study all possible transitions. And then, at the end, if you calculate superposition of these uh, effects, so we, and you multiply them by the active area of each node, you will end up with what we call cross-section, which has dimension of centimeter squared, which will tell you how uh, sensitive your circuit is to, to this type of effects. And then, knowing the radiation profile of your environment, you can calculate the, the expected upset right in the uh, final application. So now let's try, to, having covered the basic of the single event effects, let's try to uh, check how we can mitigate them. And here also uh, technology plays a significant role. So of course, nowhere technologies offer us much smaller devices. And together with that, what follows is that usually supply voltages are getting smaller and smaller, as well as the, the node capacitance, which means that for our single event upsets, it is very bad because the, the critical charge which is required to flip our bit is getting less and less. But at the end, at the same time, physical dimensions of our transistors are getting smaller, which means that the cross section for them being hit is also getting smaller. So overall, uh, the effects depend on really circuit topology and the radiation environment. So another protection method could be on the, uh, introduced on a cell level. And here we, we could imagine that uh, increasing cell, uh, critical charge. And that could be done in the, the, the easiest way is just to increase the node capacitance by, for example, putting larger transistors. But of course, this also increases the, the collection electrode which is not uh, nice. And another way could be just to increase the capacitance by adding some extra metal capacitance, but it of course slows down the, the circuit. Another approach could be to, to try to store the information on more than two nodes. So I showed you that on a simple SRAM cell, we store the information only on two nodes. So you could try to come up with some other cells, for example, like that one, in which the information is stored on four nodes. So you can see that the, the architecture is very similar to, to the basic SRAM cell. Uh, but you, you should be careful always to very carefully simulate your design, because if we analyze this circuit, you, you quickly realize that this circuit, even though it, the information is stored in four different nodes, uh, the, the, the same type of loop exists as in the basic circuit, meaning that at the end the circuit offers basically no hardening with respect to the previous uh, cell. So actually we can do it better. So here we can see a, a typical dual interlock cell. So the amount of transistors is exactly the same as on, in the previous example, but now they are interconnected slightly differently. And here you can see that this cell has also two stable configurations. But this time, data can propagate the lo low level from given node can propagate to only to the left-hand side, while the high level can propagate to, to right-hand side, which offers, uh, and b each stage being invertering, it means that the, the fault cannot propagate for more than one node. Of course, this uh, cell has some drawbacks. It, it consumes more area than a simple uh, 
uh, SRAM cell and also write access requires accessing at least two nodes at the same time to really change the state of the cell. And so you may ask yourself how effective is this cell? So here I, I will show you a cross-section plot. So it is probability of having an error as a function of injected energy. And as a reference, you can see a per pink curve on the top, which is for a normal not protected uh, cell. And on the green, you can see the, the uh, cross-section for the error in the dye cell. So as you can see, it is order of magnitude better than the normal cell, but still it is not that the cross-section is uh, far from being negligible. So the, the problem was identified, so it was identified that the problem was caused by the fact that some sensitive nodes were very close together on the layout. Uh, and therefore they could be upset by the same particle because as we mentioned that single devices they are very small we are talking about di dimensions below a micron so after realizing that uh, we designed another cell in which we separated more sensitive nodes and we ended up with a blow curve and as you can see that the cross section was reduced by two more orders of magnitude and the threshold was increased significantly so if you don't want to redesign your standard cells, you could also uh, apply some mitigation techniques on block level. So here we can use some encoding to, to encode our state better. And as an example, I will show you a typical humming code. So to protect four bits, we have to add three additional parity bits, which are calculated, uh, calculated according to this formula. And then once you calculate the parity bits, you can use those to, to check if the state, integrity of your internal state. And if any of the parity bits is not equal to zero, then you, the, the bits become in, instantaneously, they become syndromes indicating where the error happened. And you can use this information to, to correct the error. Of course, in this uh, case, the, the, uh, the efficiency is not really nice because we need three additional bits to protect only four bits of information. But as the state length increases, the, the protection also uh, is more efficient. Another uh, approach could be to, to do even less, uh, meaning that instead of changing anything in, in your design, you can just replicate your design or multiply it many times and just vote which uh, state is correct. So this concept is called triple modular redundancy and it is based around the voter cell. So it is a cell which has uh, even, uh, sorry, odd number of inputs and output is always equal to majority of its input. And as I mentioned that the idea is that you have, for example, three circuits, A, B and C. And during nor normal operation when, when they are identical, the output is also the same. However, when there is a problem, for example, in logic part B, the, the output is effective, so this problem is effectively masked by the voter cell and it is not visible from outside of the circuit. But you have to be careful not to, to, to take this picture as a, as a design temp template. So let's try to analyze what would happen with a state machine, uh, similar to what Stefan introduced, if you were to just uh, use this concept. So here you can see uh, three state machines and voter at the output. And as we can see, if we have an upset in, for example, state register A, then the, the state is broken, but still the output of the uh, uh, circuit, which is indicated by letter S, is correct because B and C registers are still fine. But what happens if some time later we have an upset in memory element B or C? Then, of course, the, 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 the state of our um, system is broken and it, we cannot recover it. So you can ask yourself, what can we do better in order to, 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 to avoid this situation? So just to be sure, please do not use this technique to, to, to protect your circuits. So the easiest mitigation could be to use uh, as an input to your logic, to use the output of the voter cell itself. What it offers us is that now whenever we have an upset in one of the memory elements for the next computation, for the next state, we always use the voted output, which ensures that the, the signal will be removed one clock cycle later. So if we have another hit sometime later, it basically it will not affect our state. Until now, we consider only upsets in our registers, but what happens if we have transient in our voter? So you see that if there is no uh, state change, basically the transient in the voter doesn't impact our system. But if you are really unlucky and the transient happens when the clock transition happens, so when, whenever we lodge the data, 
uh, we can corrupt the state in three registers at the same time, which is less than ideal. So to overcome this limitation, we can consider skewing our clocks by some time, which is larger than the maximum transient time. And now, because we, each register samples the output of the voter at slightly different time, we can corrupt only one flip-flop at, uh, at the time. So, of course, if you are unlucky, we, we can have uh, problematic situations in which one register is already in new state, the other register is still in the old state, and then it, it can lead to undeterministic uh, result. So it is better, but still not ideal. So, as a general theme, you, you, you've seen that we were adding and adding more resources, so you can ask yourself, what would happen if we triplicate everything? So in this case, we triplicated uh, registers, we triplicate our logic and our voters. And now you can see that whenever we have an upset in our register, it can only affect one uh, register at the time and the, the error will be removed from the system one clock cycle later. Also, if we have any upset in a voter or, or in a logic, it can be latched only to one register which means that in principle we created a system which is really robust. Unfortunately, nothing is for free. So here I, I compare different uh, triplication variants. And as you can see, the, the more protection you want to have, the more you have to pay in terms of resources, being power and area. And also, usually, you pay small penalty in terms of maximum operational speed. So which flavor of protection you, have, you, you, you use depends really on application. So for most sensitive uh, circuits, you probably you want to use full TMR, and you may leave some other bits of logic unprotected. So another, if, you, if your system is not mission critical and you can tolerate some downtime, you, you can consider scrubbing, which means periodically checking the state of your system and refreshing it if necessary, if an error is detected, using some parity bits or a copy of the data in a safe space. Or you can have a watchdog which will find out that the, something went wrong and it will just reinitialize re the whole system. So now having covered the basics of all the effects we, we have to face, we would like to show you the basic flow which we follow during designing our radi uh, radiation hardened circuit. So of course we always start with uh, specifications, so, so we try to understand our radiation environment in which the circuit is meant to operate. So we come up with some specifications for uh, total dose which could be accumulated and for the rate of single event upsets. And at this moment it is also not uh, very rare that we have to decide to move some functionality out of our uh, detector volume outside where we can use uh, off-the-shelf commercial equipment to do uh, number crunching. But let's assume that we, we go with our ASIC. So uh, having the, the specifications, of course, we uh, proceed with functional implementation. This we typically do with hardware description languages, so very log or VHDL, which you may know from typical FPGA flow. And of course, we write a lot of simulations to, to understand whether we are meeting our functional uh, goals, so wh whether circuit behaves as expected. And then we selectively uh, uh, select some parts of the circuit which we want to uh, protect from radiation effects. So for example, we can decide to use triplication or some other methods. Uh, so these days we typically use triplication as the most straightforward and eff very effective method. So you can ask yourself, how do we triplicate the, the, the logic? So this, the simplest could be just copy and paste the code three times, add some postfixes like A, B, and C, and you are done. But of course, this solution has some drawbacks, so it is time consuming and it is very error prone, so maybe you have noticed that I had a typo there. So of course, we don't want to do that, so we developed our own tool, which we call TMRG, which automatizes the, the, the process of triplication and, uh, and uh, eliminates the two main drawbacks which I just described. So after we have our uh, code triplicated, and of course not before rerunning re all the simulations to make sure that everything went as expected, we then proceed to synthesis uh, process in which we convert our high-level hardware description lang languages to, to gate-level uh, netlist in which all the functions are mapped to gates which were introduced by Stefan, so both combinatorial and sequential. And here we also have to be careful 
because uh, modern uh, CAD tools are, have tendency, of course, to optimize the, the logic as much as possible. And our logic, in most of the cases, is really redundant, so it is very easy to... So it should be removed, so we, we really have to make sure that it is not removed. That's why our tool also provides some uh, constraints for the synthesizer to make sure that our design intent is clearly, clearly and well understood by the tool. And once we have the output netlist, we proceed to place and route process where the, this kind of netlist representation uh, is mapped to a layout of what will become soon our digital chip where we place all the cells and we route connections between them. And here there are another, there's another danger which I mentioned already is that in modern technologies the cells are so small that they, they could be easily affected by a single particle at the same time, so we have to really space out the, the, bit, the cells which are re responsible for uh, keeping the information uh, about uh, state to make sure that single particle cannot upset A and B, for example, registers from the same uh, uh, register. And then in the last step, of course, we have to verify that everything what we have done is correct. And at this level, we also try to introduce some uh, single event effects in our uh, simulations. So we could uh, randomly flip bits in our system. We can also inject transients. And typically, we used to do that on the netlist level, and which works very fine. And it is very nice, but the problem with this approach is that we can perform the simulations very late in the design cycle, which is less than ideal. And also that if we find any problem in our simulation, typic typical netlist at this level has probably a few orders of magnitude more lines than our initial RTL code. So to trace back what is the problematic line of code is not so straightforward at this time. So you can ask yourself why not to try to inject errors in the, in the RTL design. And uh, the, answer was, the answer is that it is not so trivially to, to map the, the hardware description languages, high-level constructs to what will become combinatorial or sequential logic. So in order to eliminate this problem, we also develop another open source tool, which, is, which allows us to uh, uh, so, so we decided to use Yoses open source synthes synthesis tool from Clifford, which was presented on the con Congress several, several years ago. So we used this tool to make a first pass to, through our RT RTL code to understand w which elements will be mapped to sequential and combinatorial. And then having this information, we, we used CocoTB, another Python verification framework, which, is, which allows us a pro, pro programmatic access to these nodes and we can effectively use, uh, inject uh, the errors in our simulations. And I forgot to, uh, to mention that the TMRG tool is also open source, so if you are interested in any of the tools, please, tool, tools, please feel free to, to contact us. And uh, of course, after our uh, simulation is done, then in the next step we, we really tape out and so we submit our chip to manufacturing and hopefully a few months later we received our chip back. All right, so uh, after patiently waiting then for a couple of months while your uh, chip is in manufacturing and you spending time on preparing a, a test setup and uh, uh, preparing yourself to, to actually test if your chip uh, works as you expect it to, uh, now it's uh, probably also a good time uh, to think about how to actually validate or test if all the measures that you've taken to protect your circuit from radiation effects actually are effective or if they are not. Mm. And so again, we will split this in two parts. So we will probably want to start with testing for the total ionizing dose effects, so for the cumulative effects. Um, and for that, you typically use X-ray radiation, relatively similar to the one used in medical treatment. Um, so this radiation is relatively low uh, energetic, which has the upside of not producing any single event effects, but you can really only accumulate radiation dose and focus on the accumulating uh, effects. And typically, you would use a machine that looks somewhat like this, so a relatively compact thing you can have in your laboratory. Um, and you can use that to really uh, accumulate large amounts of uh, radiation dose on your circuit. And then uh, you s uh, need some sort of mechanism to, to verify or to quantify how much your circuit slows down uh, due to this radiation dose. And if you do that, you typically end up with a, a, a graphic such, such as this one, where on the x-axis you have uh, uh, the radiation dose your circuit was exposed to. And on the y-axis, you, you see that the frequency has gone down over time. And you can use this information to, see, to say, OK, in my final application, I expect this level of, of radiation dose. 
um, and I can still see that my circuit will work fine under some given environmental condition or some operation condition. Um, so this is the test for the first class of effects. Um, and the test for the second class of, of effects for the single event effect is a bit more involved. Um, so there what you would typically start to do is go for a heavy ion test campaign. Um, so you would go to a specialized, uh, relatively rare facility. Um, we have a couple of those in Europe and it would look perhaps somewhat like this. So it's a small particle accelerator somewhere um, that typically have, uh, they typically have different types of um, heavy ions at their disposal that they can um, accelerate and then shoot at your uh, chip that you can place in a vacuum chamber. Um, and these uh, ions can uh, deposit very well-known amounts of energy in your circuit and you can use that information to characterize your circuit. Um, the downside is a bit that these facilities tend to be relatively expensive to access and also a bit hard to access, so typically you need to book them a lot of time in advance and that's uh, sometimes not very easy. Um, but what it offers you, it, you can, um, using different types of ions with different energies, uh, you can really make uh, a very uh, well-defined sensitivity curve similar to the one that Shimon has described you can get from simulations and really characterize your circuit for uh, how often um, any single event effects will appear in the final application if there's any remaining effects left, if you have uh, left something unprotected. Mm, the problem here is that these particle accelerators typically just bombard your circuit um, with like thousands of particles per second, and they hit basically the whole area in a random fashion. So you don't really have a way of steering those or measuring the position of these particles. Um, so typically you are a bit in the dark and really have to really carefully know the behavior of your circuit and all the quarks it has, even without the radiation, to instantly notice when something has gone wrong. Um, and this is, this is all, uh, typically not very easy, and you can kind of compare it with having some weird crash somewhere in your software stack and then having to uh, f first take a look and see what actually has happened. Um, and then to be, um, typically you find something that has not been properly protected and you see some weird effect in your circuit, and then you uh, try to get a, a better idea of where that problem actually is located. And uh, the answer for uh, these t types of problems involving precision is of course always lasers. Um, so we have two types of laser experiments available that can be used to more selectively probe your circuit for these problems. The first one being the single photon absorption laser. And it uh, sounds uh, this relatively simple in terms of setup. You just use a single laser beam that shoots straight up uh, at your circuit from the back. And uh, while it does that, it deposits energy all along uh, the silicon and also in the diffusions of your transistors and is therefore also able to inject energy there, potentially uh, upsetting a bit of memory uh, or exposing whatever other single event effects you have. And of course, you can steer this beam across the surface of your chip or uh, whatever circuit you are testing and then find the sensitive location. Um, the problem here is that the amount of energy that is deposited is really large due to the fact that it has to go through the whole silicon until it reaches the transistor. And therefore, it's mostly used to find these destructive effects that really break something in your circuit. Uh, the more clever and uh, somehow beautiful experiment is the two-photon absorption laser experiment in which you use two laser beams um, of a different uh, wavelength. And these actually do not have enough energy to cause uh, any effect in your silicon if only one of the laser beams is present, but only in the small location where the two beams intersect. Uh, the, actually, the energy is actually large enough to produce effects, and this allows you to very selectively in only a very small volume um, induce uh, charge and uh, uh, cause an effect in your circuit. And uh, when you do that, now you can systematically uh, scan both the X and Y directions across your chip and also the Z direction and can really measure the, the volume of sensitive area. And this is what you would typically get of such an experiment. So in black and white in the back, you see an infrared image of your chip where you can really make out uh, the individual, let's say, structural components. And then overlaid in blue, you, could, uh, you can basically highlight all the sensitive points that made you measure something you didn't expect, some weird bit flip in a register or something. Um, and you can really then go to your layout software and find what is the, the register or the gate in your netlist that is responsible for this. And then it's more like operating a debugger in a software environment, um, tracing back from there what the line in co of code responsible for this bug is. Um, and uh, to close out, it is um, always best to uh, learn from mistakes, and um, we offer our mistakes as a guideline for if you ever feel yourself the need to uh, design radiation tolerant circuits. So we want to present two or three small uh, issues we had in, in circuits where we were convinced it should have been working fine. 
So the first one, this you will probably recognize, it's this full triple modular redundancy scheme that Shimon has presented. Um, so we made sure to triplicate everything, and we're relatively sure that everything should be fine. The only modification we did is that we, to all those uh, registers in our design, we added a reset um, because we wanted to initialize the system to some known state when we started up, which is a very obvious thing to do. Every CPU has a reset. Um, but of course, uh, what we didn't think about here was that at some point, there's a buffer driving this reset line somewhere. And if there's only a single buffer, what happens if uh, this buffer experiences a small transient event? Of course, the, the obvious thing that happened is that um, as soon as that happened, all the registers were upset at the same time and were basically cleared, and all our fancy protection was invalidated. So next time, we decided, let's be smarter this time. And uh, of course, we triplicate all the logic and all the voters and all the registers. So let's also triplicate the reset lines. Um, and while the designer of that block probably had very good intentions, um, it turned out that later then when we manufactured the chip, it still sometimes showed uh, a complete reset without uh, any good explanation for that. And what was left out of the, the scope of thinking here uh, was that uh, this reset actually was connected to the, the system reset of the, of the chip that we had. And typically, pins are on a chip are something that is not available in huge quantities. So you typically don't want to spend three pins of your chip just for a stupid reset that you don't use 99% of the time. So what they did, uh, at some point, we just connected again the uh, reset lines to a single input buffer that was then connected to a pin of the chip. And of course, this also represented a small sensitive area in the chip. And again, uh, a single upset here was able to destroy all three of our flip-flops. All right. And the last lesson I'm, I'm bringing, or the last thing, uh, that uh, goes back to the implementation details that Shimon has mentioned. So this time, really simple circuit. We were absolutely convinced it must work, because it was basically the textbook example that uh, Shimon was presenting. And we were, the code was so small, we were able to inspect everything, and were very much sure that nothing should have happened. Um, and what we, what we saw when we went for this laser testing experiment uh, in a simple, simplified form is basically that only this first voter, when, when this was hit, uh, always all our register was, was, uh, was upset, while the other ones uh, were never manifested to, to show anything strange. And it took us quite a while to actually look at uh, the layout later on and figure out that what was in the chip was rather this. So two of the voters were actually not there. And uh, Shimon mentioned the reason for that. So synthesis tools these days are really clever at identifying redundant logic. Um, and because we forgot to tell it to not optimize this redundant pieces of logic, which the voters really are, it just merged them into one. Uh, and that explains why we only saw this one uh, water being the sensitive one. And of course, if you have a, uh, a transient event there, then you suddenly upset all your registers. And that, without even knowing it, and with being sure, uh, having looked at every single line of Verilog code and being very sure everything should have been fine. Um, but that seems to be how this business goes. So uh, we hope we, have been, uh, we had the chance and you were able to uh, get some insight in, in what we do to make sure the experiments at the LHC uh, work fine, what, what you can do to make sure the satellite you are working on uh, might be working OK even before launching it into space. Um, if you're interested in some more information on this topic, feel free to pass by at the assembly I mentioned at the beginning, or just meet us after the talk. And otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, there's about 10 minutes left for Q&A, so if you have any questions, walk to a microphone. Uh, and as a uh, cautious reminder, questions are short sentences with, uh, they start with a question, well, end with a question mark. And the first question goes to the internet. Well, hello. Um, do you also incorporate radiation as a source for randomness when that's needed? So we personally don't. So in our designs, we don't. But it is done, indeed, for random number generators. This is sometimes done that they use uh, uh, radioactive decay as a source for randomness. So this is done. But we don't do it in our experiments. We'd rather want deterministic data out of the things we build. <laughs> OK, next question goes to microphone number four. Um, do, you do, uh, do you do your um, duplication before or after elaboration? Yeah, so currently, we do it before elaboration. So we decided to, that our tool works on Verilog input and it produces Verilog output. Because it offers much more flexibility in, in the way how you can incorporate different triplication schemes. If you were to apply it only after elaboration, then of course, doing a full triplication might be easy. But then you, to having a really precise control or on types of triplication on different levels is much more difficult. <laughs> 
Next question from microphone number two. Is it, is it possible to use uh, DC-DC converters or switch mode power supplies within the radiation environment to power your logic? Or do you use only linear power? Yes, so, so, so at CERN we also have a dedicated program which develops r radiation hardened DC DC converters to operate in our environments. So, yeah, and they are available also for space applications as far as I'm aware. And they are hardened against total ionizing dose as well as single event upsets. Okay, next question goes to microphone number one. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. I'm just wondering, would it be possible to hook up every logic gate in every water in a way of mesh network, and what are the pitfalls and limitations for that? So that is not something I'm aware of, of, of being done. So typically, no. So I, I wouldn't say that's, that's something we would do. I'm not really sure if I understood the question. Yeah. So maybe you can rephrase what your idea is. Can I? Yeah. On the last uh, slide. There were a, a lesson learned. Yeah, case. one of those. In here, yeah. Would you be able to connect everything interchangeably in a mesh network? Ah, so what you are probably asking about is whether we can build our own FPGA, like yeah. programmable logic device. Probably. Yeah, and so, so this we typically don't do because in our experiments, our power budget is also very limited, so we cannot really afford, afford this level of complexity. So of course you can make your FPGA design radiation hard, but this is not what we would typically do in our experiments. Next question goes to microphone number two. Hi, I would like to ask if the orientation of your transistors and your chip um, is part of your design. So um, mostly um, you have um, something like a bounding box around your, your design and with um, attack surface in different sizes. So do you um, use this, um, this orientation to minimize the attack surface on, on, of the radiation on, on chips if you know the source of the radiation? No, so I don't think we do that. So of course we control our uh, orientation of transistors during the design phase, but usually in our experiment the radiation is really perpendicular to the, to the chip area, which means that if you rotate it by 90 degrees you don't really gain that much. And moreover, our chips usually they are mounted then in a bigger system where we really don't control how they are oriented. Again, uh, microphone number two. Uh, do you take metastability into account when uh, designing voters? Or? Well, the voter itself is combinatorial cell. Yeah, but uh, if the state of the uh, Rest can change in any time that then the voters can have like glitches, yeah? Correct. So that's why if, so to avoid this, so we don't take it into account during the design phase, but if we use the scheme which is just displayed here, we avoid this problem altogether, right? Because even if you have metastability in one of the blocks, like A, B or C, then it will be fixed in the next clock cycle. Because usually our systems operate at relatively low frequencies, hundreds of megahertz, which means that any metastability should be resolved by, by the next clock cycle. Okay. Thank you. Next question, microphone number one. How do you handle the register duplication that can be performed by synthesis and pleasant route? So the tools will try to optimize timing sometimes by adding registers, and these registers are not uh, triple. Yeah. Yeah, so what we do is that, I mean, in a typical, let's say, standard ASIC design flow, this is not what happens. So you have to actually instruct the tool to do that, to uh, do retiming and add additional registers. Uh, but for what we are doing, we have to, let's say, not do this optimization and instruct the tool to keep all the registers we describe in, in our RTL code to keep them until the, the very end. And we really also constrain them to, to always keep their associated logic uh, triplicated. Yeah. Next question is for the internet. Do you have some simple tips for improving radiation tolerance? Simple tips. Um, Put your electronics inside the box. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, but there's, there's just no, no single one-size-fits-all textbook recipe for this. Uh, so it really always comes down to analyzing your environment, really getting an awareness first of what rate and what, what number of events you are looking at, what type of, of particles cause them, and then take the appropriate measures uh, to, to mitigate them. So there's no one-size-fits-all thing, I'd say. Next question goes to the microphone number two. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, how much of your 
software used to design is actually open source. I only know super expensive chip design software. Should I? <laughs> yes. So indeed, you're right. The, the core of all the, the implementation tools, like the synthesis and plays and route stage for the ASICs that we design is actually commercial closed source tools. Um, and, uh, and if you're asking for the fraction, that's a bit, bit hard to answer as we cannot give a statement about the size of the, the commercial closed tools. Uh, but we trust, try to, everything we develop, try to make it available to the widest possible audience and therefore decided to make the extensions to this design flow available uh, in public forum. And that's why these tools that we develop um, and share among the community of, of ASIC designers in this environment is, are open source. Thanks. Yeah. Microphone number four. Um, have, you, have you ever tried using uh, steered ion beams for more localized uh, radiation ingress testing? Yes, indeed. And the picture I showed actually uh, didn't disclaimer that. But the facility you saw here um, is actually a facility in uh, Darmstadt in Germany. And it's actually a micro beam facility. So it's a, a facility that allows steering a heavy ion beam really on a, a single position with less than a micrometer accuracy. So it provides probably exactly what you were asking for. But that's not the typical case. That is really a special thing, and it's probably also the only facility in Europe that can do that. Microphone number one. Um, was very good. Very good talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is: uh, Did you compare um, what you did to what is done for securing uh, secure chips? You know, when you have uh, credit card chips, uh, you can make fault attacks into them, so you can make them malfunction and extract a cryptographic key, for example, from a banking card. Um, there are techniques here to harden these chips against fault attacks, so which are like voluntary faults, where you have like randomness faults due to like involuntary attacks in a way. Can you explain if you compared in a way what you did to these? Um, so no, we didn't explicitly compare that, but it is right that the techniques we present can also be used in a variety of different contexts. So one thing uh, that's not exactly what, what you are referring to, uh, but relatively on a similar uh, scale is that currently in very small technologies you get to problems with the, with the reliability and yield of the manufacturing process itself. Meaning that sometimes just the metal interconnection between two uh, gates in your circuit might be broken after manufacturing. And then adding this sort of redundancy with, with the same kinds of techniques can be used to make, like to produce more working chips out of a manufacturing run. Um, so in this sort of context, these sorts of techniques are used very often uh, these days. But um, I'm, and I'm pretty sure they can be applied to, to these sorts of uh, security fault attack uh, scenarios as well. Next question from microphone number two. Hi. Um, you briefly also mentioned the mitigation techniques on the uh, cell level. And uh, yesterday there was a very nice talk uh, from the, uh, from the um, Libre Silicon people. And um, they are trying to build a standard cell library. Uh, open source on the cell library. So, uh, are you in contact with them, or uh, maybe you could help them to uh, improve their design in, in, in the radiation hardness? No, we also saw the talk yeah. yesterday, but we are not yet in, yeah. in contact with them. No. Sigma Angel, does the internet have questions? Yes, they do. Wow. Um, two, in fact. Uh, the first one would be Would TTL or other BJT based logic be more resistant? Uh, yeah, so depending on which type of errors we are considering. So BJT transistors, uh, they have, so Stefan in his part mentioned that TID, that displacement damage is not a problem for CMOS devices, but it is not the case for BJT devices. So when they are exposed to, to, to high energy hadrons or, or protons that they degrade a lot. So that's why we don't use them in really uh, our environment. They could be probably much more robust to single event tra uh, effects because the resistance everywhere is much lower, but they would have another problem. And also another problem which is worth mentioning is that for those devices, they consume much, much more, more power, which we cannot afford in our applications. And the last one would be, um, how, do you, how do I use the output of the full TMR setup? Is it still three signals? How do I know which one to use and to trust? Um, yes, so with this um, architecture, what you could either do is really do the, the, this full triplication scheme to your whole logic uh, tree, basically, and really triplicate everything. Or, and that's uh, going in the direction of one of the, the lesson learns I had, 
Um, at some point, of course, you have an interface to your chip. Um, so you're, you have pins left and right that are inputs and outputs. And then you have to decide either you want to spend the effort and also have three dedicated input pins um, for each of the signals, or you at some point have a voter and say, OK, at this point, all these signals are combined. But I was able to reduce the amount of sensitive area in my chip significantly and can live with the very small remaining sensitive area that just the input and output pins provide. So maybe I will add one more thing is that uh, typically in our systems, of course, we triplicate our logic internally, but when we interface with external world, we can apply another protection mechanism. So for example, for our high speed serializers, we would use different types of encoding to add protect to, to add like forward error correction codes, which would allow us to recover uh, this type of faults in the backend later on. Okay. If the la if, the, if you can keep very, very short, last question goes to microphone number two. Okay. Um, I don't know much about physics, uh, so just a question. How uh, important is the physical testing after the uh, chip is uh, manufactured? Isn't the simulation, the computer simulation enough if you just shoot particles at it? Uh, yes and no. So in principle, of course, you are right that you should be able to simulate all the effects we look at. Um, the problem is that as the designs grow big, and they do grow bigger as the technologies shrink, and they get have, uh, so this final netlist uh, that you end up with ha can have millions or billions of nodes, and it just is not feasible anymore to simulate it exhaustively, uh, because you have to have so many dimensions. You have to uh, change when you inject, uh, uh, for example, bit flips or transients in your design in any of those nodes for uh, varying time offsets, and it's just the, the state space the, the circuit can be in is just too huge to capture in a in a full simulation. So it's not possible to exhaustively test it in simulation. And so typically, you end up with having missed something that you discover only in the uh, physical te testing afterwards, which you always want to do before you put uh, your chip in the final e experiment or on your satellite and then realize it's, it's not working as intended. So it has a, a big importance as well. OK, thank you. Time is up. All right. <laughs> thank you all very much. We'll. Uh...